Well, let me pop myself in there. <laughs> Welcome to Tea Time. We are back this afternoon. I forgot to put myself on the screen. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. So we are here this afternoon with an incredible lady from Canada. That's right. We are here with Francine Cosman, and she's going to share with, her, with us her incredible memoir called Nurse. We're also going to be talking about politics, art galleries, uh, and all of the good stuff, like favorite colors and her one word, why she describes her that word and also her TEA. So grab your tea, grab your coffee, grab a glass of water, whatever you'd like to grab and join us for a good, incredible, strong cup of tea. So before we get started, we'll do the disclaimer and we'll do the bio and then we're going to get Francine in here because she's sitting patiently in the back in the studio and we're going to pour you a good, strong TEA this afternoon. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live Show. Ms. Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Ms. Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogue and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussion for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Ms. Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I, Ms. Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect that and I will see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea times this, this year are done on Thursday unless they are a rescheduled tea time. So be sure to check out Thursday morning, afternoon and evening for tea time. Now, let me get the incredible Francine Cause in, in the studio with us and let's pour a good strong cup of tea. I'm going to get her to share a little bit and then I'm going to jump in and out of her bio. And I just want to get this tea just rolling and pouring so we can get get some good old TEA served. Welcome, friends. Hello, Miss Liz. Thank you for having me. I kind of got a little tongue-tied, and I put myself in the back of the studio to watch the video, and then I forgot to put myself back in. Said, oh, my goodness. I was like, oh, it's a blind screen. Where am I? Well, there you are. So welcome, Francine. It's an honor to have you. If you'd like to share with the guests a little bit on who you are and where you're from. Yes, um, I'm originally from Ontario. I was born in Windsor, Ontario, and we moved around a lot. And um, I've been a lifelong believer in education, uh, going into many different facets of my life, involved getting different 
uh, elements of education, whether it was studying a few courses at a university, whether it was becoming an amateur artist, uh, reading gazillions of books, self-taught on many things, a firm believer that throughout our lifetime uh, and my lifetime, those exposures to different uh, thoughts and to education are so important. They're a very significant part of my personality, I think. So Francine, you, you wrote this incredible memoir called The Nurse. Yeah. What is, what's behind The Nurse's Memoir? It goes back to realizing that all my history was rapidly disappearing. Um, the shops in St. John, New Brunswick that I loved to go to and to shop in were all torn down for a mall. So that was a disappearing piece of history. One of the uh, schools I attended was demolished. So that little chunk of history was gone. Um, the church that I was married in was demolished. Another chunk of history gone. And my nursing school, ultimately, the St. John General Hospital was imploded. That was a huge chunk of my history gone. Wow. And when I was a student nurse in the educational wing at the General, there was um, a series of photographs of Victorian era nurses with very long uniforms, little starched caps like bonnets on the top of their head. They weren't smiling. They looked so prim, proper, and scared. And I used to go and look at those pictures of the Victorian nurses, and I think, well, who were you? And what was your name? And what did you like about the career you were doing? And did you make a difference? And that kept playing in my mind that nobody ever captured their stories, ever. They were gone, like the buildings were gone and the hospital was gone. And I had kept a diary through my nursing and I had my yearbooks, I had contact with other students, former students, and I liked to write. So I thought, I'm going to write my student nursing memoir and just see where it goes. So I would pick it up and I would put it down and I'd spend maybe several weeks with writer's block and not get anywhere. And then I'd go back to it. And each time I went back to it, it felt more right for me to write. And I, I don't write by typing. I write longhand on paper with a pen. And when you do that, for me, the writing juices flow. And so I would write and write some more. And then COVID happened. And that was an endurance test for all of us. We were, for the most part, stuck at home. That finally was the push for me to say, I'm going to do this before I get too old. And I'm going to write Nurse a memoir. And that's what I did. I wrote it. And every story in that memoir is exactly correct. I didn't make up any stories. Someone one day said, well, I wish it was two times longer because they loved reading it and they were praising it, but they wanted more. And I had to basically say, I wasn't going to make up stories and put in the book. They're all factual from my experiences and factual from my diary that I kept. And it, it wasn't hard to recall these things. They were so vibrant and vigorous in my memory. So I was able to go back fairly easily into my memory and just keep on writing. And then some days it would come in as a big blast of inspiration and more memory would come percolating to the top. So, yes. So Francine, what got you into nursing? Like how old were you when you started? I was 18. And uh, when I was a little girl, my mother went to visit somebody at the general hospital and she pulled me along and I thought, oh, she's taking me over there for a needle. That was my childish thought. I was going to have a needle in my arm or my bum. And uh, I, I remember the smell of ether wafting down the elevator shaft when we went on that visit because the operating rooms were up on the seventh floor. 
And I can remember that cloying smell of ether. And it really stuck in my memory to this day. If wow. I think about it, I can smell the ether. So that was my first uh, visit to the general. And then when I was a little older, I got sick and we had to have a doctor make a house visit. And it was Dr. George Bate. Oh, he was wonderful. He was new. He was young. He was establishing his practice. And he sat on the foot of my bed and he chatted to me. And then he said, stick your tongue out. I want to look at your tonsils, which I, I didn't have any tonsils by that time. But anyway, I'm going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think again we all got our tonsils removed, right? As soon as we had a sore throat, it was okay, yeah. tonsils come out. <laughs> yeah. So I just loved Dr. Bate and I looked at him and I thought, oh, I want to be a doctor like him. And that sort of fueled the thinking that oh, someday I could be a doctor. Uh, of course, at that young age, I had no idea what that really meant. And then as I reached the age of 17 or 18, I had to make choices for my future for education. And I wanted to go to university, but we had no money to send me. And basically that ruled out studying to be a doctor. There were three career choices that a young woman could make. You could go into teaching, uh, which was wonderful. Uh, you could go into being a secretary, which my sister studied to be, and you could go into nursing. So I chose to go into nursing. And I remember the conversation with my dad. Um, he basically said to me, because both my parents were not educated, he said to me, what do you need an education for? You're only going to get pregnant in this order, get married and settle down with a family. What do you need an education for? Well, I have to say I was pretty wild when he gave me that answer. And I said, I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to have kids and I'm never going to be a slave to a man. I remember telling my dad that and then I trounced off to my bedroom and cried in my pillow. So anyway, that brought me into the nursing profession and I applied to the St. John General and ultimately got accepted as a student there. And Wow, I am so glad I did. Uh, you kind of just took me back to when I was a young girl and my father said the same thing, you know, you're going to be barefoot and pregnant and married and you don't need your education. And the word never, I said that to my dad all the time. I'm never going to do this. And my dad said, don't put that word never because you're going to end up doing it. So you kind of just took me back for a moment. So <laughs> that that's why I have that surprise face because it just kind of was like a moment of, back in time where the old school thought was women yeah. couldn't be anything right yeah. except for pregnant and married yeah. and i really want to thank you for saying that and it took me back a moment but mm -hmm. thank you for doing that francine and thank you for sharing that because that is a raw moment as well right that we were yes. put through as women and as daughters from yes. our fathers yeah um, and a lot of that went on back in the 50s and 60s and even later i mean that's nothing new truthfully but yeah. it's how we, it's how we uh, handle that. It's how we move out of that zone of I can do nothing. I'm no good. I'm just going to have a stay-at-home life. And, and I'm not knocking stay-at-home moms for a minute because they do a fabulous job and they deserve all the praise and support they can get. For me, I had been raised in a dysfunctional family the first 10 years with alcoholism and violence. And I wanted away from that kind of setting i wanted an education and i wanted to be someone with a brain in my head that could provide me a living if i were to remain single all my life you know and i didn't but those were the thoughts that were in my brain at the time i know that and that's a strong statement i wanted to be you know as a woman i wanted to be and i did it because yeah. you've done a lot of incredible things in your life francine uh you got into the politic world uh, as a politician and that from the nurse, because you were a nurse and then you got into the politic uh, politics and all of that. So what, ju what jumped? Because those are two different fields. What got you to change that? Well, I've always been issues oriented. And when there would be an issue in my local community, whether it was a street that was washed out or uh, traffic problems or social issues, I was able to speak out uh, fairly well at, at those early years. 
And in speaking out, it, it got attention, which wasn't my purpose, but the attention that it got had people coming to me saying, you really ought to run for politics. And over a period of time, I did. And I had followership, which you can't get elected if you don't have followership. And people knew I was hardworking and I was well-intentioned and I could be a change agent. And I, I didn't win everything I tried to do in terms of the issues, of course not, but I knew my voice was making a difference. And uh, it was important to me, that aspect that I could make a difference. And so the more people came to me and pushed at me to, to run, uh, that's what happened. I, I first ran for county council uh, on Halifax County Council years ago. And then we became the first new town in 69 years. And it was Bedford. And I was very involved in that process. And so people were coming to me then saying, well, you've done all this work. You ought to run for mayor. And my initial reaction was, no, I can't do it. But then more and more people said I could do it. So I did. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? If we don't try, we don't know. You yeah. Know? And yeah. sometimes people see other things in us that we don't see ourselves. And then we're like, oh, okay, you see that? Well, let me give it a try. Yes, exactly, Miss Liz. Exactly. That describes it. Oh, you see it. Maybe I don't. Maybe I should. Maybe I can. And I do. <laughs> so what did that teach you about yourself, Francine, as the first mayor? Well, I guess it taught me that I had to live up to a lot of expectations and work hard to do so. I was fully intending to work hard. I had no idea how hard it was going to be uh, to shape up a brand new town council and to put all the infrastructure in place and because we came from nothing. And I used to say to my, my children, it was like baking a cake. You took all the ingredients, you threw them in a pot and you put it together and out came a cake. And, and my daughter uh, did a little sort of a cartoon drawing. Um, my mummy knows how to bake a cake. My mummy's a politician. And I still have that in one of my journals somewhere that there's a little drawing that, uh, I don't know if it was Andrea or Lara, but one of them did that. And if they're listening right now, they're saying, mom, you should remember who did it. But <laughs> <laughs> right, it's like, you, you need to remember. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes at this age, the old memory doesn't quite tick over as fast as you'd like it to, but anyway. So you, you ran for a lot of different ministries and departments and all of that. So yeah. how did you get into all of that, Francine? Well, uh, when I finished being a mayor, there goes the dog bark. <laughs> We're at home for tea. Uh, grandma, grandma has a visit. <laughs> I eventually, again, uh, People were asking me to run for office, and uh, I did. It was a contested nomination, and I won the nomination, and then I won the seat. And my first term in office, um, I wasn't in cabinet, but I was the deputy speaker of the legislature, and that was really a difficult and challenging role. And my second term of office, uh, the premier asked me to be the minister of community services. That's uh, a very, very challenging uh, role to be in. And then it, and partly along the way, he also asked me to take on additional portfolios like the civil service, uh, the disabled persons commission. That's an issue I'm very keenly aware of with disability and uh, the status of women. So all those um, responsibilities came together. It was a very, very busy time doing that, but I loved it. And uh, community services really fit well with my nursing background. Uh, I believe being a nurse was the foundation for the skills that carried me all through my life. Uh, pragmatism, the ability to focus, um, to do a job, all the facets that were taught into us as young nurses later became the foundational skills for other jobs that I did. So I'm, I'm very, very thankful that I had that training in my life. So you also were appointed the status of women uh, president. So can yes. you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yes, that was earlier than my political time. 
um, I had been asked to take on that job, which I did for four years. And it was the time of the Badgley uh, Commission on Family Violence, Child Abuse. Um, there were commissions on pornography and prostitution. And over my four years with the status of women, I traveled all over Nova Scotia, speaking on all those issues, uh, bringing the film, Not a Love Story from the National Film Board to be um, played in those meeting venues and educating women to the social changes that were coming at us fast and furious around increasing family violence issues and child abuse. Um, it was an extremely difficult four years, just unbelievably emotionally difficult because those are topics that are filled with pain yep. and they're topics that are valid today as much as they are 20 years ago, 40 years ago. And I don't think it's gotten any better. I think the mass media, the digital platforms have all contributed to what we're seeing happening now. And it's just been called uh, through the Commission of Inquiry here in Nova Scotia into the mass casualty. It's been called a very serious epidemic around family violence and something that absolutely has to be addressed in a meaningful way for change. And I'm so glad that you brought that up, Francine, because a lot of people ask me too, do you see a change? I don't see a change. I see an increase. It should be decreasing. We should be having prevention programs instead of aftercare programs. Why should we wait for the aftercare? Like, why should we wait for the, the, the event to happen before we create these aftercare? Let's create prevention programs, you know, give the red flag, uh, like give symptoms. I find that a lot of counseling for myself as well as a survivor is that the aftercare is there, but there's no prevention there. In a setting such as Nova Scotia is, and I can't speak, of course, for the rest of the country, the rural environment leaves us as women under-resourced, whether it's a transition house, uh, whether it's psychological counseling, whether it's adequate policing who would believe a story that we would tell about being hurt. And uh, a huge issue for women is the fear of losing their children if they report what their husband is doing. And all those rural issues uh, make it that much worse. And then you have the mind numbing violence on television and the digital platforms that young boys visit and see around pornography as early, you know, as soon as they have a handheld device with an internet connection, they can get onto a porn site. And I don't have answers, I have questions. But I think it is worse now because those are major contributing factors. And the commission report really made good recommendations and an action plan has to flow out of that because if there's no political will, and I hope to God there is political will, uh, if there isn't, then that fantastic piece of work is going to gather dust, dust on a desk. And um, I, I agree with you, Miss Liz. I, I'm seeing it in the same manner that you are. Yeah. And it's sad because it should be the reverse. We're, we've come so far that it should be complete reverse. We should be having a huge decrease in these numbers, but in, instead we have the increase. And that's really sad. Uh, you mentioned that being a nurse helped you with the community services. Being a nurse is also like a worker, right? You're sitting with your patients, you're understanding your patients, their pain, their suffering, their story. So it kind of aligns. And I find that that might have been a, a way for you to communicate with the community services a little bit better. Yes, because of the sort of categories of issues, you know, that I had to deal with. And and sometimes they were taking children into custody from uh, sexual abuse in the family and violence. So I understood those issues from my earlier work. There's no doubt about that. It gave me um, a very important perspective uh, as these situations would occur. And I was sometimes told I was the voice of conscience 
in the cabinet room. And I think that conscience was based on my knowledge and background that I had sort of all those parts came together and that was very helpful in my role as a minister and uh, helpful, I think, to my constituents because I understood in many cases what they were dealing with. Well, I, I think uh, having a dysfunctional family also gave you a different perspective and look where another cabinet member might have not had those things happen in their life, right? They might have had mm -hmm. the, a good home where you got to see the dysfunction. So you understood the dysfunction a little bit deeper than the other ones did. You know, it's interesting in that, Miss Liz. Um, I have to give my dad credit. When I was about 10 years old, he sought help with Alcoholics Anonymous, and he never touched a drop of liquor after that. He transformed his life, and he became a man of faith and read his Bible every day and was very guided by those principles. And I think, I, I feel it's important to, to stress that because my first nine, 10 years were very much affected by family violence, seeing it. Yeah. Dad never laid a hand on us, but mentally seeing it, it lays its own emotional hand on your brain and on your heart. So yes, those things definitely affected me and I've carried them all my life. But I like to give a little plug to my father now long gone, of course, that he did uh, reform his drinking and became a man of faith and a strong man who was able to pull himself out of that. And that took huge strength on his part. Especially back, back in those days, right? The, yeah. You know, for a man to admit that he needed help, you know, even today men struggle with asking for help because of the stigma and the, you know, uh, pull up your pants, be a, uh, be, be a big boy, you know, stop crying. That's, that's inbreded into the men, you know, and the boys. And, and now even to this day in the year 2023, we're still having men that are struggling to speak up and ask for help because of the generation patterns and cycles. So I'm really glad that your dad got help, you know, because I'm sure that that had an impact on what you did as well in the oh. future with your life. Definitely, you know, because we had made so many moves when I was a little girl because he'd lose his jobs, you know. And when he finally stabilized and we got our first home and it was out in a bit of a country setting, um, it was Renforth, which now is all Rothsay in New Brunswick. But there was a forest out there. There was a farm on the hill and I could run around and explore those things and really find out who am I uh, as a little girl transitioning into stability I knew then I could have friendships because we were in one place and not bopping around from place to place. And um, yeah, it was life changing, life altering. Yeah. So I think it's a good time to ask you, Francine, what is your T? So if I give you the word T-E-A, what words would you be giving me today? Well, I think uh, the T probably would be transformation because every single moment of our lives Things are happening to us, around us, from us, and life isn't static. It's always changing. There's always movement and flow, and that is transformative. When we have it coming into our spirits and our hearts and our emotions, um, transformation is an everyday thing that happens to us, and we don't recognize it necessarily with that word we may not think this is happening right now or it's changing me, but the whole process of living is bringing that in and moving it out and transforming ourselves. So I think my, my T word would be transformation. Yeah. Yeah. And your letter E, what would, what word are you giving me? Emotion. And why for? Well, I guess if we're emotionally healthy, we're in a good place and our emotions govern our actions 24 hours around the clock. And if we're fortunate enough to have a loving heart, 
we can let our emotions out and send uh, positive vibes to other people. Um, yeah, and for women, we are much better suited through our sort of socialization growing up to be able to express our emotions, uh, less so for men, unfortunately. But uh, emotion would be the E in the T, and it would also be connected to spiritual growth. Oh, I like that. Yeah, spiritual healing, spiritual strength. Um, yeah, that, that would be my E. <laughs> and your letter A, what word you got? Hmm. A would be awareness. And it's so important that we are aware of what is happening in our lives and in our family's lives and our friends in the life around us, uh, expanding that into awareness of what's happening in the environment, in our country, go beyond our country, uh, just being very informed and aware because each of us is a voice and each of us has a role and we need to use that voice. We need to be aware. And sometimes people will say, well, I can't make any difference. Why would I try? Every one of us can make a difference because we have a voice, we have a brain, we have a heart. And I'm still speaking out on issues even at this age. And I sort of bet sometimes I drive my, my town counselor to look around the bend, but you know, I, I'm a believer in that. If you see something that's not right, then do something about it. Don't just sit back and complain, be aware. Uh, use your voice, make a difference, reach out and make it happen. I really love that you say that, Francine, because it's true, right? You can sit there and complain or you can be a voice and make a difference. Yes. You know, you're using the same amount of energy, you know, and you can actually be that one voice that actually opens a change, opens opportunity for a different way and different solution, you yes. know? when we're just sitting there and we're complaining, we're not actually doing anything but complaining. We're just wasting yeah, time. Negative. <laughs> when that's always, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where you might be able to go to someone and say, you know what? I don't like what I see. I think we need to change this. How can we change it? What steps do I need to take? You know, who do I talk to? And get involved in your community and that as well. I think it's really deeply important to be involved with your community and see what's going on in your community. Uh, you were a voice for Nova Scotia. Uh, so you've seen a lot of things in your community that you didn't like. So you became that voice and mm -hmm. you said, you know, and you became the mayor and you were like, I don't know if I can do this, but a lot of people were pushing me, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes we need that push. We need that out of our comfort zone and say, okay, let's just see where this goes. Um, so I think it's a good time to ask you uh, one word to describe yourself, Francine. Mm. I suppose determined. Determined. <laughs> I could have said loving. I could have said kind, but, but mm. and I would be those too. But I think determined has been a factor in who I am. You know, determined to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. You, do you, you also gave me the word complex before we set up the interview. Why the word complex? Well, nothing in life is simple and no personality is simple and um, everything around us is complex. And it's, it's a bit of a challenge sometimes to pick out the parts that you can work with and uh, make a difference on because issues are complex. There's no such thing as a simple, easy fix for most things. So I guess that would be part of the complexity or uh, complex issues, complex reactions. So, yeah. I see that a lot with you, you know, as a speaker and being a voice of change and that, and being a leader, being a strong woman to, to mentor a lot of other women who are staying at home because they've been told the same thing. Uh, like you said earlier, you know, your father said that you wouldn't be anything but pregnant and married and, you know, and the word never. And it just kind of brought me back <laughs> at the beginning of the show. And, I, 
I think we as women, we need to have examples and role models to look up to. And I think a lot of women out there have looked up to you, Francine, and said, thank you for doing what you've done because you've been that example that they needed to see, you know, and you come from a hard life, but you made a difference with your life. And, and that's what we need to be doing is giving that message that no matter where we come from, we can make that difference still. That's very true, Miss Liz, you know, and, and we know many women who also, they're walking in those shoes, you know, and um, when we open up together and talk about things, a lot of people would say, oh, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. That's an old expression, meaning you were born into wealth and ease yeah. and all the rest. But in, in my own example, nothing could have been further from the truth. So we we have to try and figure out what can we do with ourselves when we're running up against a brick wall or we're in a situation that we need help with. Um, but to try and find courage to make a difference with ourselves and, and how our story unfolds, you know. I really, if I could give a big hug to every woman out there who's experiencing difficulties, even that is a form of strength, you know, when you're down and out and you get a loving hug from someone, a positive, healthy hug, it's empowering. And uh, yeah, and having a cup of tea with it's even more empowering. <laughs> <laughs> right it's not like a beverage tea and a lot of people when they hear tea time they're like oh we get to drink tea well you can bring your tea if you want and you bring <laughs> coffee uh, you know you don't have to like tea we really need to start opening within ourselves who we truly are you know be authentic be our real selves and like you said like you were the voice of conscience in 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 the in the house you know because you you lived it you experienced it so you understood more uh, and I want to thank you, Francine, for all of your services that you've done for Nova Scotia. I've never been there. Maybe I'll come and visit and we can have oh, tea in person. Yes. Um, but we need to have women that give us an example of how to be better. You know, we're not telling them how to be. We're just giving them an example that we can get through it. You know, we don't have to stay that pregnant and home wife. We're not. And I'm not out there bashing home wives because I'm a single mom. And it's hard, you know, but we have to be able to say there are women out there that are giving us examples. We can do it too, you know, mm -hmm. if we can get through it, we can do it too. And I think that's what we get when we share our stories and why we pour such strong tea, you know. Um, I want to get into your color because color tells a lot about a person. So what is your favorite color, Francine? It would be blue. And why blue? I find blue very uh, restful, peaceful. I think of a blue sky. Uh, I think of a blue crystal, a blue stone, uh, blue clothing, blue walls. It's just restful and serene. And it, it sort of gives me a sense of balance. If I'm like my bedroom's a pale soft blue and it's the favorite color in the house. And um uh, it just settles me, I guess, because there are days when we're all unsettled and when we're not so calm and collected. And if I go into that space, it's almost like putting on a meditation tape and listening to it. Yeah, so it, it does something to my, my spirit. And when you look at blue in energy terms, it is the color of the throat chakra, uh, which is a communication chakra. So if you if you go up through the chakra colors and, and I trained as a healing touch practitioner and I've studied some Reiki. So our colors are the colors of the rainbow will be the chakra colors match the colors of the rainbow. And so when you come up into the throat, it is the, the blue color that is assigned the throat chakra, which is our communication center. And so there's there's a linkage there as well for me. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense for all of the things that you've done. You've been that voice, you know, voice of change, voice of strength. It really does make a difference. Uh, you know, even a nurse, being a nurse, what did that teach you about yourself, Francine? Well, it taught me that I felt a lot. I could never be a person in nursing who didn't feel what my patient was feeling. Um, 
my empathy bar is is set very receiving and giving. And I think um, it was about realizing that I could make a significant difference in a patient's life if they were suffering pain, for example, and I was sitting beside them holding their hand. That's an exchange of energy. And in the person who's the nurse, who's healthy and strong, hopefully, you're sending that strength through that hand connection into the patient who is receiving it. And uh, several years back, I was called into the hospital in the city to give healing touch treatment to a lady who was considered at the end of her life. And she almost appeared to be unconscious when I entered her room. And I put my hands on her. I put my hand on the ankle and I put my hand on her shoulder. And I could feel an exchange of energy happen. And then her eyes fluttered open and she looked up at me and I switched from ankle and shoulder to holding her hands, holding her hand in both my hands. And I just sat there. We didn't talk in the first several minutes. I just had my hands on her. She was very, very fragile. But in the course of doing that, I could feel that she was taking up energetic strength in that exchange. And she became more alert. She knew me because we both attended the same church. And she called me by name, which was a wonderful connection because when I was called in, they really thought she was not going to live another day. So I guess from a healing perspective and that exchange of energy, um, that was a powerful part of my nursing, but it was also a powerful part of studying as a healing touch practitioner. So in nursing, um, there are stories in my book, of course, about various times uh, when I, I know that I made a difference with the capacity to touch with love, positive, healthy touching. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. This is <laughs> no, it did. And, you know, uh, being a nurse, my my youngest is a nurse. She's oh, in the sur right. sur surgical department in, right. in Hawkesbury. And her empathy is really, really high. So I, I love listening to you share on how to touch and all of that, because it actually makes me understand her a little bit more, you know? Okay. Um, so... Yeah, I'm learning so much from you just sitting here and listening and having this good open discussion about, you know, nursing and politics and yeah. how it all aligns, right? It all flows together. Everything had to happen at the time that it happened in order for the flow to continue. Um, in your book, what was the hardest chapter for you to write? Oh, I think the story... Well, there were a few, actually. Uh, the story about the young woman who was my patient on Christmas Eve, who was so dreadfully, dreadfully ill, that was a tough one to write. The other uh, story that always comes into my conscious memory is about the little miscarriage, the little fetus that was so early, it didn't look human at all, but it had a heartbeat. And I've had people call me and say they cried when they read that part of my book. Uh, it brought back a lot of emotion for me when I wrote it. And I can still see that little heartbeat beating when I, my mind can go right to that little ball and that little, well, conceptus, because it was so early a pregnancy, but a little human heartbeat beating away. Yeah, it, it does still resonate very deeply with me and you worked a lot in the case rooms before we started the tea time we talked a little bit in the back studio yeah. and you talked about the case rooms what happened in the case rooms uh labor and delivery and uh in my time as a nurse i used to keep a tally over the years i delivered 106 babies and i still think i could deliver a normal delivery i could do with my eyes closed so 
Yeah, K-CERM, they would do the, the patients would come in and be in labor. And I've always said when the moon is full, that's when the babies pop out because the gravitational pull of the moon on the, on the waters surrounding the baby puts women in labor very quickly. And it was a given fact you had to have more staff on during a full moon because you were going to have a case room that was just hopping. So it would be being with the patients, preparing them for birthing, uh, sitting with them during labor, listening to the fetal heart, um, dealing with the occasional emergency, which would be all heck would break loose. A uh, patient might start to bleed or the baby's heartbeat might drop dramatically. Uh, any number of factors that could complicate a normal delivery were dealt with in the case room. And it would mean getting to the operating room part of the case room and doing a cesarean section as quickly as you could to get the fetus out, get the baby out. And um, then some postpartum care. And yeah, that was the significant aspect of being a case room nurse. Now in my day, men didn't normally come into the delivery room but then the shift occurred that they were starting to be encouraged and i i used to think don't let them faint you know i don't want to be taking care of two patients at the same time and invariably you'd get a man in and he'd go gray and then all of a sudden clunk and he's on the floor and he might bang his head on the, on the hard floor and you're thinking who do I help first? The man who just went out and just on the floor or the woman who's pushing her baby out? You know? So those, those were all aspects of, uh, of the case room. It was dynamic and I loved it. And it was always, always 99.9% .9 of the time it was cheerful. You had the occasional loss, which was just horrifically sad. But the overwhelming part of being a case room nurse, hard work, loving energy, beautiful new babies, happy parents. Who could ask for more? Right. You know. So have you ever met any of the babies you delivered? No. No. No? No. Not no. one? <laughs> no. My niece. My nieces. Yeah. My my sister's children. I was there um, for some of those deliveries in the St. John General. But um the rest of those babies I delivered, no, I have no idea where, who they were now, you know, and, and no recall of having met them afterwards. But my relatives, uh, certainly, yes. Yeah, I've watched them grow up. Yeah. Hmm. I always wondered about that when you deliver a baby. Do you ever get to see the babies after? <laughs> no. Say, you know, 20 down. years ago, I delivered you. <laughs> yeah. You know, you could go down into the nursery and see it for a little while. And sometimes, you know, the parents would want to see you and thank you. But... Uh, after leaving the hospital and the delivery, it would be unusual to have another connection with them. So, yeah, except for my own relatives. <laughs> so by writing this memoir, Francine, what, what do you want to bring to the table for other nurses out there? Our health care is in crisis. And it's in crisis both from the supply of nurses and the supply of doctors and their employment. We've known about the crisis for 10 years and we have done very little to make a difference and to change. I don't have answers. I have lots of questions and I would like to see a dialogue take place where our nurses would sit down with the politicians who are the only ones who can sign on the bottom line for change it is time to look at the nursing model that we have for how we educate our nurses. And I think the only way to do that, uh, I've just started to evolve some more thinking on this. I think it is time for a task force to be established on nursing education. Okay. And that's not a, a criticism of nurses. It's looking back to political decisions that chose to move nursing in a new direction without understanding or looking at the impacts. And a group of men sitting in a cabinet room do not know what it is to be a nurse and do not know what 24 hours around the clock being, being needed as a nurse means. Uh, putting it into a university setting on paper and on in theory was a good thing. It expanded certain facets of knowledge, but from an experiential and practical sense, 
it's left a lot to be desired, which is why we are in a nursing shortage of magnitude that is staggering. So I would like to have student nurses uh, who are looking at the career, at least look at the book. It would tell them what nursing is about, for sure. I would like the dialogue to happen that would say, what can we do better to have more people enter and be retained in the profession and not leave the week after they finish and go give Botox needles somewhere instead of working in a hospital? We're heavily invested in the education and we need the return of a better career experience for nurses so that they don't finish their degree and feel they need to be mentored. Um, oftentimes, when they first go on the floor to work, whatever the choice of floor is, I am told they feel very overwhelmed and very inexperienced. Our training program was all about experience. The three years were totally experiential. We did our studies in the labs. We went on the floors. We got reinforced with our knowledge and what we could do. And yes, it's a vastly changed field of delivery now for nursing. There's so much technology. But I think we need the discussion and the debate. We need an action plan to go forward. And if it means changing how we train nurses, then so be it. And perhaps uh, the general training could be looked at in the first instance, and then looking at the areas of speciality, you know, the operating room, the case rooms, the um, bone marrow transplant units, and so on. There's areas of speciality that a new grad uh, would likely need an intensive training period to function in some of those parts of the hospital. So my initial support for the idea of writing this book was let's just get a memoir out there. And then I have friends who have recently retired from nursing. I have friends whose daughters and granddaughters are in nursing. And it became very abundantly clear through COVID how desperate things were. When we had to shut down units, we had to shut down emergency rooms. Um, nurses with COVID, of course, they couldn't work when they were sick and, and what to do. Massive amounts of hours of overtime, uh, exhausting hours, being told you couldn't have your holiday that year because there was nobody to let you go away on your holiday and get refreshed. These are significant issues. And for some patients laying on a floor in an emergency room because they can't get timely care because there aren't enough staff, you know, it can be life-threatening. We've seen this in the news in Nova Scotia in the past six months. So I would like my book to be a catalyst for discussion, potentially for change. And it's a discussion that needs to happen. So do you feel that this book should be in all hospitals? I think it should be in all schools of nursing. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I mean, I just think it's it's a good read for people to understand. Uh, you know, if you're sitting in a high school grade 12 class thinking, what do I want to do? I want to be a nurse. Then having access to something like this would certainly show you before you leapt in with both feet, what is nursing about? And that makes a lot of sense having it in the schools before they get to the field. Yes, yeah. I think it would give people food for thought. And, um, you know, someone shared a story with me last week. I, I spoke with a group of retired nurses in Halifax, and someone shared that a young nurse, a new nurse, didn't feel she could take care of one patient. She didn't feel she was skilled enough, and she wanted to have someone else share that one patient, and it just doesn't work that way. We, we don't have enough staff for that, you know, share a patient kind of thing. And it really surprised me because when I look back to my own training, we often had eight or 10 patients to look after and we had to do it and we did it and we did it well. So it's like back care, you know, we've, we've had to have a specialist in back care go around and look at people's skin to see is their skin holding up. And that the reason for that is they're laying in one place too long. Their skin is breaking down uh, a nightly skin check is no longer part of training. Ooh. My training, you had to give a back rub every night to check the back of the person's the skin on their back to look for pressure sores. 
and pressure sores can be deadly. And we've had examples of that in the last few years in Nova Scotia as well. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot and with all the cutbacks and all of the shortage, there's a lot of things that are not being done anymore. They're not being trained to be done. Wow. Yeah. It, it goes further than that. It goes into the heart of training. If, if you put an elderly Alzheimer's patient in a chair in his Johnny shirt, and this happened very close by with a friend, with her dad, and you pop him in a chair and you don't give him a blanket on his bony cold knees and he's got bare feet, it, it's, I can't fathom that. I mean, it's just common sense that if you're trained to nurse that person, you wouldn't leave them sitting bare kneed and cold and shivering in a chair for several hours. Yeah. And thank God the family came in to visit and found this, you know, so yeah, it's about the nature of training. What, what is the training, the experiential part of it, not just the important book work. So any final words you have before we wrap up your tea time, the hour is coming almost to an end here. And I really want to thank you, Francine, for taking the time and sitting and having tea and getting this knowledge out there. And for all the listeners that were listening to the tea time right now and that will watch the replay later, if you know of a way to make this debate happen that Francine's talking about, let's get let's get the wheels moving, you know? And you don't have to be in Nova Scotia. You can be in Ontario. You can be in Alberta because this is affecting all the all of us not just in where fencing is and not just where i am so if we can get some doors open and you're listening or if you know somebody that would benefit from this tea time please share this tea time because i would really appreciate that and francine any final words before we wrap up well i guess they would be on a sort of spiritual uh, thought one of the uh it's easter and one of the change agents 2000 years ago was in my faith it was christ he was uh, an advocate for women, and he was an inspirational figure, and he respected um, the rules of the day, but he found the way to be politically outspoken. And he was a change maker uh, in his era before he was crucified. And then I go to Gandhi, a pacifist who changed all of the political system in India. And we are, we are our own change agent. We're not Jesus, we're not Gandhi but we have the capacity to make a difference and to speak out and to do so respectfully and not be calling for a revolution you know so i think that would that would be my final word and uh i, I yeah well thank you so much and thank you again for joining me here on tea time and thank you to all the supporters and uh a big, big thank you to OC Publishing. As you can see, it's been on the screen. If you'd like to get in contact and have Francine Cosman as a guest, reach out to OC Publishing. Anne is an amazing young lady, and she'll help you as well to get Francine booked on your show. Uh, you know, the more awareness we can get out there, the better we can open doors and we can make a change. And like Francine said, we can be that change maker. Uh, you know, use your voice because you can make a difference. And again, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and joining us and sharing some good, strong tea. We're going to wrap it up with OC Publishing. Great interview, lots of food for thought, and ho hopefully it will trigger a deeper discussion about changes in nursing training across the country. I hope so, too. Uh, I deeply hope that these tea times impact lives and make a difference. So if one tea time doesn't resonate with you, the next one will. But for this one, I really encourage everyone to sit back grab your tea, grab your coffee and share it with a friend, share it with a family member, share it with your community, share it with your house um, and parliament if you have to. We're going to open those doors one cup of tea at a time. And I'll see everybody in a couple of hours with the last tea time of this week. I'll be joined with David A. Bowles and he'll be talking about Texas and family history. So we'll be talking about the wild, wild west. So that's what we do. We serve different cups of tea here on Tea Time with Miss Liz. So again, thank you, Francine. Thank you, Anne, for all of the work you've done. And thank you to all the supporters and listeners of Tea Time with Miss Liz. I really do deeply appreciate each and every one of you. You all make a difference and you're all dear to my heart. So 
Thank you. And I will see everybody at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the last tea time of this week. And then the next week we bring back three more guests. So I'll see everybody then. So Thank until you so much. Thank you. So until then, I will see everybody at 7 p.m. Francine, don't leave. I'm just going to close up the live.